66, nothing personal word of the day for Wednesday, June 8th, 2022, 66. We're leading off with Deshaun Watson because I simply cannot believe that this story keeps getting bigger and more troubling every day. The New York Times did an article about Deshaun Watson yesterday, having done an investigative piece. We're not exactly talking Watergate. We're not talking about the January 6th hearings, which commence on Thursday night. But we are talking about one of the top football players, one of the top quarterbacks in the National Football League, and the issues that he's having as it relates to his proclivity for happy ending, special massages, and misogyny, and sexual assault. You follow the Deshaun Watson story on nothing personal from the beginning. What has changed from yesterday to today? Something major, two things major. Let's start with Deshaun Watson and let's end with the Houston Texans and their potential complicity in Deshaun Watson's behavior. Except I don't wanna do that. I wanna start with the Texans because they're the team. I wanna talk about the role that a team has with player behavior on the field, off the field, responsibilities that the team has, how the team can discover what its players are doing. My experience running a team tells me that there were a hundred things going on off the field with each player, and I was aware of 30 per player. Some players up to 70, some players down to five. It had nothing to do with my personal relationship with the player. It more had to do with that player's openness, that player's hiding more than another player, or that player and I not being able to communicate properly. The team would discover things about other players from other players, from the training staff, from the coaching staff, from the manager, sometimes even from the GM, sometimes from other players on other teams. I always looked at our 25 men as my children. Strangely, I was the same age as my children when I started in the business, but then I kept getting older and they kept staying the same age, like when you're a teacher. And as I got older, I really stepped into that fatherly duty, tried to be as as fun as I could be as a parent because I wanted to be both a serious parent, but also a friend, also a companion, also, a, a, a consigliere, because I always felt, and this is where I haven't evolved enough back in those days, I always felt that if I could have the players comfortable and happy, that they would play better. And if they would play better, then we would win because we would get the most we could out of the players. And so I would try to decide which players require tough love, which players required being treated with kick gloves. And I also needed to decide when I would be an enabler. An enabler is as a parent or as a friend or as a spouse, a significant other. When you know that behavior is going on that you do not think is positive behavior, that you don't think is good for the person who is doing the behaving, however, it suits you for that person to keep doing that behavior, either because that person likes doing it or because the result of that behavior is something that's additive to what you are trying to accomplish or what you want or what you need. Whether it's drinking or gambling or sex addiction or any of the other vices out there, drug use. So I had players who I knew got stoned and I saw players get stoned. I may have gotten stoned with players, but I certainly never saw and never did or never got involved with any cocaine or pills or opioids. I was not aware of any players doing those things during my time because if I had been aware, I would not have enabled that because to me those were not performance enhancing as opposed to performance enhancing drugs, which of course I was aware of and didn't say anything because why would I say something when there's performance being enhanced on my team and on all the other teams? So you understand the absolute line that's being walked, the juggling that you're doing when you decide what you're gonna make an issue of and what you're not gonna make an issue of. So Deshaun Watson goes up to the Houston Texans 
and says, you know, as part of my time here, it wouldn't be bad if I got a place where I could go in a country club slash hotel. Sometimes I need a room. What do you need a room for, Deshaun, I would have asked. Well, sometimes I like getting massages. Terrific. Can I be helpful? Well, as a matter of fact, you can. If you don't mind, can the room be under someone else's name? Well, that's strange to Sean. Why do you need the room under someone else's name? Well, because you know, I don't want people to know I'm there. I'm famous. You know the drill. That's why I enter into a hotel under a pseudonym. And I would say, of course, that makes sense. Half our players always went into hotel rooms as pseudonyms, funny pseudonyms. I even checked in with a pseudonym because back in the day, people would reach you through your hotel and they would call the hotel and they would ring your phone. Of course, after cell phones, the first thing I do when I walk into a hotel is I unplug the hotel phone because I don't want to be bothered. I've got a cell phone, which I leave with the front desk when you check in. My pseudonym was Jay Trotter. I think I've told you that before. There were certain people who knew. Most people didn't. But players did everything from porn star names to, you know, the do we cheat him and how funny names. One guy checked in all the time as Mike Hunt. That was always something that was both funny and not funny. You had Dirk Diggler. We had people checking in as that. So they'd pick a movie star or a fictitious name. Never Bambi like Julia Roberts, but stuff like that. So it would not at all strike a chord or cause me to question anything about Deshaun Watson if I'm the Houston Texans. But then my phone rings, and it's the head of security. And the head of security for the Texans calls me, or the head of security for the Marlins, somebody, I, my head of security, I was in touch with only when things were bad. It's like the head of the Secret Service, right? When you are the president. You only want to see that person never. But when there's a problem or there's a threat or there's someone in your airspace or there's a threat in your life or your kid gets kidnapped, whatever the case may be, all of a sudden, the knock on the door, the Oval Office, in comes head of Secret Service to talk to Martin Sheen, and that's when you know you're about to have a hell-breaking episode. So the head of security calling the president of the Texans and says, hey, I was wondering, could I speak to the general counsel? Because I want to give to Sean Watson a non-disclosure agreement, where it's called an NDA for short. A non-disclosure agreement is what you sign when you are doing something with someone and that someone doesn't want anyone else to know that they've done something with you or you are learning something about something or someone, that that's something or someone, they don't want anyone else to know that you've learned. It is not uncommon to sign NDAs. When you negotiate rent where you live, it is not uncommon for the rental company, for the landlord to ask you to sign an NDA as it relates to your rent, because in theory, they could be giving you a better deal than they want to give to anybody else, so you sign an NDA. When you have an agreement to buy or sell a team, there is a non-disclosure agreement, there's a non-disparagement agreement. We are not gonna discuss the terms of the deal and we are not gonna disparage Derek Jeter for a period of time. So these are not uncommon, but in 18 years, not one time did I ever get a call from a head of security, from a player, from an agent, or from a GM saying, hey David, we need to use the general counsel because we've got a player who wants to do an NDA when he sees women. I mean, this is Jeter type gift basket stuff, isn't it? The first thing I would say to a guy, a player, if they ask for an NDA, I would say you've got to have less sex and you've got to do it with fewer people, but more often. That'd be the first word of advice. The second word of advice would be, if it's after 2 a.m. and you need an NDA, go to bed, watch a movie, and then fall asleep peacefully. When you require a woman to sign an NDA, that means that you have some concern that that woman is going to do something that will tell the world that you've done something that you shouldn't have done, that you don't want people knowing about. General rule of thumb in your life when you're a public figure is that don't do anything that you wouldn't want to read about on the front page of the paper. But now it's sort of different. It would be don't do anything that you wouldn't want to see trending on Twitter. I think about that all the time. And of course, I'm not perfect. I do plenty of things I wouldn't want to see trending on Twitter. But what I do when I do them is I always have my PR statement, my excuse ready to go. Well, of course, I was doing this, this, and that because 
I'm just a normal man. Just an example like that where you come up with something where you have a reason. So what would be the reason that Deshaun Watson would need non-disclosure agreements? Hmm. Did he have plans going into a massage that he wanted more than just a massage? Because frankly, if you're getting a woman on Instagram to come and massage you and it's just a regular full body massage, a sports massage, some massage like that, you don't need an NDA. But if you plan on doing something unsavory that involves sexual assault, you may want the NDA, but believe me, that's not gonna stand up if there's criminal conduct. But it's not criminal conduct because a grand jury decided not to indict. Brilliant, Deshaun. The Houston Texans had to have been aware that Deshaun Watson wanted an NDA. The fact that they got him a room in a club under a different name is not ideal in terms of a set of facts. A judge could certainly look at that. A commissioner of football could certainly look at that should he choose to and say, wow, that smells a little bit like complicity. Smells like it. I don't think it rises to complicity without more facts. Like, are we sure the NDA came from more than just the head of security? Can we look at the NDA and does it specifically say that we are not going to disclose the fact that we did a massage that included happy endings? So there's a ton of things we don't know. So everyone calling for the Texans to be punished, etc. It's a little premature. And as you know, with things that are premature, not good. So what about 66? 66 is the number of women who massaged Deshaun Watson over a period of, let's say, a year and a half. 66 women, not 22, not 23, not 24, 66 different women. Now, what is your reaction to 66 women? Just out of curiosity, is your reaction, listen, if you got 66 massages from 66 different women, what is the crime? Will Chamberlain slept with 10,000 people? I've seen players have sex with women at every night of a road trip and then a homestand. Multiple women in a night. This is absolutely not breaking news. Professional athletes are young, rich, and they have sex. Okay. Are we telling you something you don't know? If we told you that an athlete had 66 partners over the course of a year and a half, would you be high-fiving? Would you say, wow, that makes sense? Or would you say, my God, what a slut, a male slut, a male whore. Would you say that? So the number 66 in and of itself is really not the issue to me. The issue is a pattern of behavior that is being alleged by right now 24 of the 66 who are saying basically the same set of facts. Got the massage, turned over, got erect, looked for something more. In three cases, he's acknowledging that there was something more, but it was post-massage, no money exchanging hands, which as we know, is total horse hockey. How do you do that? For those of you who've ever gotten a massage, do you say, okay, time's up. It's been 45 minutes. Stop. New transaction. That's not exactly how it works from what I understand. It's generally the same transaction or it's an add-on. It's like, it's like the impulse buy when you're checking out of a grocery store and you have your entire cart and you say, you know what? I'll take those gummy bears. The impulse buys are there for a reason. Oh, I need another thing, a chapstick. Damn, I forgot mine. And then you get home. Shit, I've got 25 chapsticks. But it was right there at checkout. You think that stuff's a mistake? Is that all one transaction? Or when you're doing the Amazon, if people who buy that always like getting this and this, and you say to yourself, of course I need paper towels and Tide Pods when I get Kleenex. That makes perfect sense. Well, massages are sort of like that. When you know there's going to be a happy ending, you sort of don't talk about it. And then at the end, it's sort of, oh yeah, there it is right before checkout. So a judge sees this pattern of behavior, and that will be admissible when there is a court case, which of course there won't be because Deshaun Watson, despite his protestations, will not appeal. So all of this is going on, and people are saying, what about the Browns? What about the trade from the Texans to the Browns? Can the guaranteed money become non-guaranteed? We talked about it yesterday. Watch the show. Are the Haslam's going to try to reverse the trade? Will the NFL force a reversal of the trade? Is it possible that all this will happen now? 
if Deshaun Watson were not a good quarterback, you know we're not having this conversation, right? Any other player in any other position short of Aaron Donald would have been released, would never have played again. For crying out loud, you've been doing the, doing the national anthem and you're done. Now the NFL is one of the few leagues where domestic violence, abuse, sexual assault, it's not the end of the world. It's a little, you do just a little quick. You can even be involved in a shooting, right? And you just get a little suspension, and then we pretend it didn't happen, and we all just keep going. And the band plays merrily on. In this case, Deshaun Watson would have been history. And I think that that's how this ends. And I wasn't positive yesterday, but this case, these cases are going to settle. And I questioned myself and spent a lot of time thinking about it yesterday after the show into today. And I really was thinking about the juice squeeze argument. And I just don't see it right now. You're talking about a guy who hasn't taken a snap in a year. The NFL and Roger Goodell cannot have Deshaun Watson playing for the Browns. The season starts tomorrow for crying out loud. Think about it. It's right now. I think the first game is like in September. There is no way that Roger Goodell has Deshaun Watson playing for the Browns when the season starts. So the Cleveland Browns have to make a decision. Do they double down or do they cut their losses and try to make that contract not guaranteed and take him to court? And I don't want the Browns to come out of here unscathed. And the reason I don't is that I'm so angry about their press conference when they announced him. And we spent a good part of a show talking about it when Jimmy Haslam talked about I spoke to my daughters and GM Andrew Berry talked about the work they did and the due diligence they did. And I said to you and I say it again, they're so full of it that it makes me laugh. I've done it. I've been there trying to convince you that I've done something when I haven't done anything of the sort because I think it's going to sound better. You can't fool me even if you're trying to fool you. So given that I don't want to fool you, I'd like to inform you. Andrew Berry, the GM, talks about the work they did, the investigators they hired. They hired me and Coca to do it. And we read, we Googled, and we did a Google search, and we saw 22 lawsuits. So we said to uh, Jimmy Haslam and, and Andrew Berry, we said, hey, there's 22 lawsuits. But man, did you see the way he hits that guy in the post pattern? OMG. Hey, Jimmy, do you have any rings yet? No, I don't. Well, I got to tell you, Deshaun is fine. And we've done due diligence. Now, we can't speak to the 22 women, but we know for sure that that's all and we're good. Everything's done. We're fine. We're thorough. We've been totally thorough. 66 women. And it's the New York Times whose budget is not exactly the size of yours, Jimmy boy. How many resources did you plug in before you got the conclusion you wanted to get? Have you ever done an investigation where you know you want to get to the end and you know what the end is supposed to be and therefore it's not a real investigation? <gasps> Am I describing every single front office investigation that every front office ever does whenever they're accused of front office misconduct and they know that they're going to hire people to do an investigation but they don't want to define anything but there's going to be a fall person for sure? Hello, Johnny Gruden. This is how we roll, folks. We are so cocky and egomaniacal in the sports world as executives and people, owners who are billionaires, that they're, they're too good for you people. They're too good. They assume that you're not going to ask any questions and that reporters aren't going to care enough. There won't be enough consequences to their actions. And when you don't have consequences to your actions, guess what? You don't curb your actions. We call it entitlement. That's what we call it. We're entitled. Those players are entitled. We're entitled. We say that, right? We're entitled to our day in court. It's entitlement. Our constitutional right to bear arms. We're entitled to our AR-15s because we want to shoot prairie dogs and other such vermins. Entitlement is one of the least fortunate words in the English language. But man, do we take advantage of it in the sports world and in the C-suite as executives. There's a reckoning coming, and it's coming for you, Deshaun. It's coming for you, Andrew Berry, and it's coming for you, Jimmy Haslam. Roger Goodell, maybe this time, is going to stand up 
and actually do something. When we come back, we're going to review a movie that I found, and then we're going to talk about what happened in Los Angeles and what's happening in Florida. We're covering all the coasts today on Nothing Personal. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. Thank you for making it through that gauntlet of ads that Coke and I get no revenue from. Not even from the reads that we don't do well when the companies call back and say, man, that read sucked. Do it again, Samson. I thought they were funny. I guess some companies don't like funny reads. So there's a bunch of commercials and then you read, you rate, you review, you follow. Tell your friends about Nothing Personal. There's 3 million podcasts out there for you to choose from. And the number's growing. And I appreciate and Coke appreciates your 45 minutes every day. I really do. So we watch a movie every day. I take suggestions and every once in a while I go to the early access because it just feels good, right? Ooh, I'm getting something that no one else has. Of course, everyone with Amazon can have early access to the same things. Ooh, this movie's $3.99. I'm in. Tim Roth from Pulp Fiction. I'm in. I've reviewed a bunch of Tim Roth movies. And then I watch this 86 minute movie called Unknown. And it blew my mind. Unknown is about a man who's on a vacation with a woman and two kids. In theory, his wife and two kids. They seem rich, but it's hard to tell. She works for sure. And he just looks at the sunsets and drinks. And Tim Roth is the perfect actor for that because you know he's thinking something, but you're not exactly sure what he's thinking. And then the phone call comes in and the phone call indicates that there's a problem at home. Then there's crying. Then there's the pack your stuff, kids, we're going home. Then the husband, Tim Ross says, I don't have my passport. Wink, wink, I'm not going with you. And before you know it, he's naked in bed with someone in Mexico. And I'm thinking, wow, that was really quick to just walk away from your family Now I get it when you don't want to be around your family when someone dies because you don't know how to deal with the grief. You don't know how to deal with consoling someone because you're selfish, unfeeling, and robotic. And it ends up costing you a marriage, among other things. And then you have girlfriends and friends who need your help when there's grief to be dealt with and you don't know how to deal with it because you just don't have the capacity. I'm sorry, was that part of the show? I just lost my mind for one second. Sorry, Coca, you can choose to not include that if you want. I just went off the rails totally being personal hmm all right just in case you cut that out two six nine so tim roth doesn't go home with his family he ends up staying back in mexico and what then becomes a movie of murder strange things going on in mexico kidnapping bizarre sort of plot lines and you don't really understand what's happening other than this man doesn't want to be with his family anymore but is it his family? It's all very unknown. If I were you, I would not mind. Oh God, by the way. (laughs) Okay, Coca, don't yell in my ear. The movie is called Sundown, not unknown. Thank you. My rundown has it as unknown. Why it has it as unknown This is gonna be good. You're watching this live. You are watching this. If you're on YouTube, Nothing Personal with David Sampson, you are watching this unfold live as I go to my phone where I have my movie notes, where I write down every single movie I've ever seen, and I put stars next to the movies that I've recorded on either Levitard or reviewed on Nothing Personal. And here is the movie. It's Sundown. Why did I put unknown in the rundown? And I even talked about the fact that you're watching sunsets and sunrises during the course of the movie. God, this is live, folks. This is live, not Memorex. You may want to check it out. It may have been autocorrected, but that's, I hate when I write like, go duck yourself. Like that really is so impactful when you text that to people. All right, Los Angeles, Artie Moreno. Remember we did a thing about the Angels, how they've lost 11 in a row. And I thought that Joe Madden wasn't going to leave until Joe Madden was ready to leave. Nope, got that wrong. Artie Moreno fired Joe Madden yesterday. And I want to point out one thing about that firing only. 
No, not true. Two things about that firing only. One, Perry Manassian is the general manager. <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> Perry Manassian. Flow with it, David. That's what Coke always says. Don't pronounce the names in syllables. Just let it flow off your tongue. Because I said, is it Perry Manassian? Is it Perry Manassian? It's, and then he writes in the document, min a c n. So of course I say min a c n. Sorry, Coca. I'm gonna get better. It's only been 611 episodes. One of these days, I'm gonna know how to pronounce names. I can spell them just fine. He actually said, when asked about the firing, he said I was driving to or from the stadium, and I realized that we need a different voice. So I called Artie Moreno, and I told Artie Moreno it was time to fire Joe Madden, and Artie Moreno said, fine, so we fired Joe Madden. That is the single most misleading thing you've ever heard from a general manager. Artie Moreno puts the M in metal, the I in involvement. There is Z-E-R-O chance that Joe Madden was fired because Perry Manassian called Artie Moreno and said, let's fire Joe Madden. And Artie Moreno said, great, what took you so long? Artie Moreno called Perry and said, I've had it. Get rid of him right now. But, but Artie, you know, I get along well with Joe. And I got to tell you, I think it's really, we need some pitching. And Artie said, don't tell me that. We need a strong leader. Let's put Phil Nevin in. Phil Nevin deserves to be a manager. Phil Nevin is a tough guy. Joe Madden is just sort of an easygoing, let's have fun, let's be casual, and we, we can do it. And that's good, right? That works when the Cubs win, when the Rays win. It doesn't work when you lose, which is why Theo Epstein got rid of him in Chicago, because once you win and then you're not winning, then you're having the same fun as before you were winning, up to including winning, but then you're losing, and then your GM says, well, that is – going flat, right? That joke isn't landing anymore, Joe. Jim Bowden on CBS Sports HQ called it shtick. All managers have shtick. Joe Madden has a lot of shtick. His shtick is being a little eccentric. No problem. The Angels have not been winning. They haven't been in the playoffs since 2015. Mike Trout hasn't won one playoff game since he got into the league. Shohei Otani has never been in the playoffs. They signed Anthony Rendon, the top position player available that particular year, which has turned out to be a terrible contract. So Artie Moreno spends, 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 and loses, loses, loses. He just brought in Perry Manassian. And by the way, it's not easy to be his GM because you've got to deal with Artie Moreno. Trust me, I understand what this is like. So he was brought in because he's got the personality, he's got the right personality to deal with Artie, including taking the hit for Artie for this managerial change. And I've taken hits for managerial changes for our owner before. I get it, that's what you do for your owner. But thank God there was no nothing personal around when we were firing managers with the Marlins because otherwise there'd be someone who said, don't be ridiculous, that of course was Loria's idea. And I would have said, no, no, this was me and Larry or me and Mike or me and DJ. No, Jeffrey's idea would never be to do that. He understands that you've got to have patience. He understands that the new voice is not going to make the difference on June 8th. And he definitely understands you do not fire a manager when you're playing the hottest team in baseball, the Boston Red Sox. That's the number one rule. You fire a manager mid-season before you're playing a crappy team. So the Angels fire Madden and then boom, they lose to the Red Sox again. Same old. I think they've lost a Baker's Dozen. Joe Madden gave an interview right after he was fired, which is very rare. He gave it to The Athletic and Ken Rosenthal. He was very surprised he got fired. He believes that he did not lose the clubhouse. He believes his voice was still strong. He believes that his coaches were all behind him 100%. But then he said something fascinating. He said, it's been kind of difficult overall. I'm into analytics, but not to the point where everybody wants to shove it down your throat. He's saying the quiet part out loud, folks. Real baseball people have felt somewhat impacted by all of this. You're unable to just go to the ballpark and have some fun and play baseball. It's too much controlled by front offices these days. Joe, 
I don't disagree with what you're saying. But if you want to manage again, which is how you ended your interview by saying, I'm really good at it. I want to manage more. You don't say what you just said. Because as a front office person, I don't want you managing my team. Because now you're in the Girardi camp. You're in the over the hill, not understanding that we're not using typewriters anymore. We're not using the Apple IIc anymore. And we're not guessing by feel where we're going to play the shortstop. We know we know for a fact that this person on a 2-1 count with this guy pitching, a slider is going to be thrown and he has a 69% chance of hitting a ground ball right to where we're going to have the shortstop stand. I may have gotten to mute fast enough on that, Coca. Sorry. That's what analytics does. It tells you who to play, when to play, and where to play them. You can listen. You cannot listen. You have to use analytics as part of the arrows in your quiver. But front offices, especially Los Angeles, but there's many teams like it, they're not 50-50 analytics and eyes. They're 95-5 analytics to eyes. They don't let their managers make decisions based on gut, based on what baseball people see or feel or touch. Because numbers don't lie. My view of that has always been clear. I am not a 95-5 guy. As president of a team, I would be a 50-50 guy. I would never give the edge to the baseball people. I would never give an edge to the analytics people. I wanted to hear them both. And then with the GM and the manager, I wanted to make the decisions of how we were going to mix the ingredients. You need both. But if you're Joe Madden, you cannot say what you said and expect to ever, ever manage again. So Joe Madden's gone. And the question is, who's next? And what's interesting to me about who's next is that some years, not a lot of managers get fired. And then all of a sudden, it's like breaking the seal. If you ever been to a bar and you're drinking a lot and you don't want to go to the bathroom and then you do go to the bathroom and then you have to go to the bathroom again five seconds later, five minutes later, and you say, I've broken the seal. Don't break the seal. That's an expression I like to use. As I get older, I wait longer because once the seal is broken, you might as well just pitch a damn tent. Get right back in line. So now the managerial firing seal has been broken, and there's going to be more. Yesterday, word came out that Don Mattingly held a 90-minute team meeting with the Miami Marlins. When we would have team meetings with the Marlins, we would either the manager would approach us and say he wants to have a meeting. We would approach the manager and say we need a meeting. We would then decide who's going to be in the meeting. We would decide who we're going to tell about the meeting in advance, whether or not the media is going to hear about the meeting purposefully, whether or not we're going to comment after the meeting, before the meeting, who we're going to have speak during the meeting. All of this is decided. The Marlins have a problem. The problem is not their pitching staff. The problem is not the fact that Derek Jeter got canned. The problem is that their offense is mediocre. Their run differential is outstanding, but their one loss record is not where they wanted it to be, but is where everyone expected it to be preseason in all of the predictions and simulations. And that is a major thing in baseball when you convince yourself that the simulations are not accurate. When you say we are a 500 team and if it hits right, we're going to be competing for a playoff spot. I said that every single year, except 2013. We've got this. The Marlins are 23 and 30. They're 12 and a half back of the New York Mets. And they are not going to win 81 games this year. Bruce Sherman, for whatever reason, was convinced that his team was a playoff team, that this was a big year. They said it before the season started. Don Mattingly said, we're done with excuses. This team has to win. And they have not been winning. So team meetings are often called when there is a underperformance going on. But the Marlins team meeting was not about that. The Marlins team meeting was about discord in the clubhouse. So in 18 years, I never had a team meeting because players weren't getting along. Players weren't working hard enough. Players were violating team rules. That would be individual one-on-one -on -one with the manager and the player team meetings for macro issues, 
not micro sort of scabs that were being picked every day inside a clubhouse. Players don't get along. That is common. It's like a family. You're together every day, hours a day, small spaces. Even though everyone's on the phone, on their cell phones, there's still frustration. You saw a little bit of Pat Riley when he did the Heat press conference to end the season after they lost to the Celtics in the conference finals when he talked about Nick Lowry and he acknowledged that Nick Lowry has some issues and has to come back in better shape. That is a purposeful statement. When you say that about your player, you know that that is going to be an issue. I didn't call him Kyle Lowry. What did I call him? I'm pretty sure I said Kyle Lowry. Oh, I don't know who Nick Lowry is. I, mean, I was thinking Nick Lowe, the musician. Kyle Lowry, of course. There's some rumors that there are people out of shape in the Marlins clubhouse. There's some rumors that players aren't working as hard as other players want them to work. And Don Mattingly felt it was time to air it out in a public way. A fascinating move. Because he just as easily could have called the players who were not getting along into his office, the players who were out of shape into his office. But as a veteran manager who we hired in 2016 and is one of the sole remaining people left from when we were there, said to himself, this is the moment where we are going to have an open forum where players are going to confront each other with full accountability with the other 25 guys on the roster. So 26 guys met for 90 minutes. Don Mattingly comes out of the team meeting. He meets the media. He explains what happened. And he says, I'm not going to be surprised if we come out flat tonight. And everyone was getting on him. What kind of statement is that by a manager? He looks defeated. He looks terrible. And then you look and you see, wait a minute. They're playing the Nationals. Brilliant, Donnie. The Marlins crushed the Nationals last night. One of the easiest bets of all time to make. The Nationals, as you know, are terrible. The Marlins got good pitching from their young pitcher, Cabrera. They got a grand slam from Jazz, who, by the way, is one of the issues in that clubhouse. And they win 12-2. to two. So when you have a team meeting and you win the next die that night, I used to fall prey to this, and then I got smarter. I fell prey to the recency of the prior game. So that's why opening day always meant so much to me because when we won opening day, I felt like we could go 162-0. and When we lost opening day, I felt like we were never going to win a game. When you have a team meeting or you make a managerial change or you fire a coach or you make a trade, when something happens, you want very badly to win the following game. If for no other reason than to be able to say to the media that, look, there was a reason for doing what we did. But the underlying issue doesn't go away with the managerial change. It doesn't go away with a team meeting. It's sort of like having one therapy session, like when you're trying to have psychotherapy, you're trying to figure out your childhood, you're trying to figure out the traumas, you're trying to figure out your marriage, whatever you're trying to figure out. You go in one time and you say, whoo, we're good here. I got it now. We'll take it from here. You've given me the tools to move forward and I'll climb the mountain by myself. It doesn't work that way. You have to have more appointments and then more appointments. And then you have to dig a little deeper behind that curtain. And then you have to go a little below the surface and see, ooh, I didn't want to look at that. Let's put that back in the closet. Oh, you're going to have to look at that. No, not today. Let's look over there. Ooh, there's plenty to work on over there. Let's totally clean up that room. It's sort of like when you're cleaning your house, right? You do this. Do you clean your house? Not the dirtiest room at, the, at first, right? Because it seems overwhelming. So you, you clean the stuff that's almost already clean. It's like if you have to put away dishes or put away clothes, you take the little pile, put that away, and sort of just close the door to the dirty room. It's like cleaning your basement. It's just overwhelming. And then it gets more overwhelming, and so there's less chance you have to address it. That's what festering in a clubhouse means. And one trip to the basement doesn't make it clean. 
So the Marlins issue, Bruce Sherman is going to thank the owner of the Marlins that it's gone away, but it hasn't. Which is why Bruce Sherman is going to get so frustrated. He hired Kim Ming, which was a totally PR-based hire, then fired Jeter, gave Kim Ming more power, hoping that she can be the GM who she wants to be, signed a bunch of players who they overpaid for in Garcia and Soler, have the top pitching staff in baseball, the number one or two pitching staff, sorry, Yankee fans, deeper. I think the Marlins pitching staff may be even deeper than the Yankees pitching staff. But they're 23 and 30. Donnie, I love you, man, but you're going to get fired. And you knew this going in when we did the ownership change. You knew that you knew Jeter and that there was a chance you'd get to stay on. You knew that Jeter wouldn't want to get rid of you so quickly because of the Yankee connection. But the fact of the matter is that your time is up. And I'm sad about it because Donnie is such a good manager and such a good person and so smart around these younger players. And it's hard to be as good a player as he was and to be as good a manager as he is. It's really hard if you look at really good players being really good managers. It's really rare. I'm sorry we couldn't make the playoffs together. I'm sorry for what happened in 2016. I'm sorry that we abandoned you after 2017. But wait to see. It's an official one. Don Mattingly is going to get let go because the Marlins' problems are not going away because they don't get to play the Nationals 162 times. Wait to see. All right, nothing personal. Pick of the day. We hit it. We hit the lightning. You knew that. People think I don't pick NHL games enough. Well, we knew the lightning were going to beat the Rangers, so we're now 68-52. and 52. That series is tied at two. We're finally back to the NBA playoffs. I don't know about you, but my sort of cosmic rhythm is off. And I'm used to games every other day in the NBA playoffs. I don't like this Sunday to Wednesday, two days off, because last night I'm thinking, why isn't there a game on? There's a pivotable, 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 a pivotal game three in the NBA finals. Right now, the NBA finals has changed. It used to be four out of seven. It's now three out of five with the Celtics having home court advantage. So there's two games in Boston, then one game in Golden State then one game in Boston, then one game in Golden State. That's the five games they have left. Advantage Celtics, right? Nope. The Celtics are a better road team than a home team. This is going to be a back and forth series. The Warriors are getting three and a half points, and that's too many. We're going to take it. Warriors plus three and a half over the Celtics is the nothing personal pick of the day. Okay, last thing today, I wanted to mention something you're going to read about. You're going to read about the Walton family buying the Denver Broncos for $4.65 billion. There was a bunch of bidding. There was talk about a minority owner finally having an opportunity in the National Football League, how important it would be. You heard about Peyton Manning or John Elway, people wanting to get in on the Broncos transaction. We've talked about on this show, the Bolin family and how he did not specify a succession plan. Pat Bolin, when he died of Alzheimer's in 2000 and whatever it was, Coke in 2019 maybe, there was no succession plan. Baseball requires a succession plan that has to be filed with the league. So there are 30 succession plans in case an owner drops dead. But the Broncos didn't have it. So they went out and they tried to find buyers. And wouldn't you know it, the $59 billion man, Sam Walton, won the bidding at a price of $4.65 billion. And everybody's first reaction is, oh my God, it's the highest price ever for a North American franchise. You have the Mets who went for 2.4 or something. And now the Broncos at 4.65. And do you know who the happiest person in the country is? Because it's not the Bolin kids. It's Roger Goodell. Roger Goodell gets to go to 24 owners and say, listen, boys, I hope you're aware, while we'd all like to have minority interest, I think you'd all agree that what you pay me for, because I learned this from Bud Selig, you pay me to increase the value of your assets. The Broncos are selling for $4.65 billion. Do you know what that means, Mr. Mara? What about you, Mr. Rooney? Mr. Jones? David Tepper bought the Carolina Panthers for two and a hook. That was the last sale in the National Football League. People owning teams all over. 
I used to think it was just ego. I used to think the prices had sort of hit as high as they're going to go. And guess what? I'm wrong. They keep going higher. So Roger Goodell can say all he wants, that he wants good people in the game. He wants to cut down on the violence, the assault. He wants minority involvement, minority coaches, the Rooney rule. He's full of it. He wants someone to buy his team for $4.65 billion because that's what keeps his checking account growing. Because for Roger Goodell, it's just business. This is nothing personal. 